I'm delighted that so many of you are here, including boys and girls from La Martinia and people from the city of Lucknow, whom I warmly welcome to this evening's program. Our host for this evening will be one of our rather capable boys, whose name is Rajveer Wadhwa. But before I invite Rajveer to run us through the program, let me, of course, welcome Dr. Rosie Llewellyn-Jones back to the place to which she is so, so attached. And I'm not talking about Lucknow, I'm talking about La Martinia Estate in Lucknow. Can we warmly welcome her? The last time I met her, she was just a highly decorated academic with many publications to her credit. Now, she is a member of the most distinguished order of the British Empire, the MBE, which you see, boys and girls, written up over there, is equal to the kind of highest honors that are given by the Indian government for excellence in the different chosen field of work. In her case, academics, history, and all that we know her uh, so well for. She is not new to Lucknow and has looked absolutely the same for the last 20 years that I have known her. I'm, I'm not very sure whether that is a compliment to her today or it does not reflect very nicely on what I saw 20 years ago. But all the same, okay, Rosie remains very much unchanged. I'm also grateful that we have been able to tie up with Tonos, which is uh, the state's leading tourism uh, company. And uh, this is something that should interest both the boys and the girls that tourism is not only running around temples or uh, looking at trees that are about to fall, but it is also related to intellectual property. It is also related to knowledge. And so this is part of what Mr. Pratik Hira is introducing as the knowledge series for uh, the promotion of tourism in this part of the country. I am sure that Rajveer will have uh, something very pleasant to say about both Dr. Llewellyn Jones and Mr. Pratik, uh, Pratik Hira. Welcome to La Martinia. I now hand you over to Rajveer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce you to our distinguished guests of the day. Dr. Rosie Llewellyn Jones, recipient of the most excellent order of the British Empire, is a renowned historian whose distinguished career has been defined by a passion for unearthing the forgotten stories of the past. Among her many remarkable contributions to the field of historical scholarship, her biography of Major General Claude Martin stands as a remarkable testament to her expertise and dedication. She has even worked for the Royal Society for Asian Affairs, a learned society aimed at advancing public knowledge and understanding of Asia through its worldwide networks. As the secretary of the British Association of Cemeteries in South Asia, abbreviated as BASCA, she edits Chaukidar, a quarterly journal that reports on people and places connected with the Raj. Her works include renowned books such as New Spirit and Architecture, a Fatal Friendship, Engaging Scoundrels, True Tales of Old Lucknow, A Very Ingenious Man, Clod Martin in Early Colonial India, 200 Years of Hazrat Ganj, Hazrat Ganj Through the Times, among many more. 
Furthermore, Dr. Jones's biography of Major General Claude Martin transcends mere historical documentation. It is an evocative portrait of a man who left a mark on the history of India, especially through the establishment of the Lamartineer Estates. Her work delves deep into the lives and times of Major General Claude Martin, capturing the intricacies of his persona from his early life as an adventurous young man to his pivotal role as an architect and a military strategist for the British India. Her work is surely a testament to her commitment to ensuring that the voices of the past are heard and celebrated. Moreover, another renowned enthusiast of history present with us today is Mr. Prateek Hira. Sir has recently been appointed as the member of the Tourism and Medical Value Travel Committee. Sir brings with him 27 years of experience in the tourism industry with many researches to his credit. He is also serving as the chairman of the Indian Association of Tour Operators for Uttar Pradesh for the fourth consecutive term. Let us welcome our guests for the evening with a huge round of applause. I would now like to request our principal and our teacher of history, Dr. Siddiqui, to facilitate the guests with a memento. Dr. Jones has this wonderful Brit accent, which uh, sounds wonderful, but we have to get our sound correct. So we are going to do a sound uh, check first, uh, so that we're absolutely sure that each of us can hear her clearly. I have a hand mic. We'll see whether this is more effective or a fixed mic. Uh, we'll check that. Is it turned on? Everyone can hear me at the back. If you can't, could you raise your hands, please? There's one person who can't hear me. Perhaps we could move them to the front. Hmm. Perhaps he can hear you if he knew that you were asking him that he, whether he can hear or not. Okay? <laughs> Chirag, I'll sort you out. Huh? Okay. okay, all right. Can you um, dim that light, please? Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am extremely honored to be here. It, it is my pleasure, I can assure you, much more than for you. And I wanted to say, Carlisle very kindly mentioned um, MBE, member of the British Empire, and when this was offered to me in 2014, because they always ask if you want to accept the award, it's not forced on you, I hesitated for a long time because a lot of my academic writing has been criticizing the British Empire, and then they make you a member of it. It's quite a good wheeze. So anyway, I decided I, I would accept it because I have ambivalent feelings about the British Empire. And in fact, my new book there, Empire Building, the copies there, um, I think reflects this ambivalence. But I'm not here to talk about the East India Company. Tonight, I'm here to talk about Claude Martin and I have lived with Claude Martin for many, many years. I've written three books about him. I am constantly receiving 
more information about him or queries about him, and I don't think we're ever going to be divorced. So this is about Claude Martin, but it's also about a recent book I wrote during lockdown, which is called The Estate of Claude Martin. And by this, I mean all the th possessions which were in Martin's houses at the time of his death. So here he is, a reminder. And this is a portrait that surfaced a few years ago. It's by Johann Sofany. You will be familiar with it now, but there was great excitement when it was first found at a Dutch auction. And this, I think, illustrates the continuing fascination of history. You never know what is going to turn up next. We had no idea about the existence of this portrait until it appeared in a Dutch auction catalogue, and then there was tremendous excitement. And it was bought by a London gallery and sold on. And I actually saw it in the flesh, so to speak, or rather in the paper and chalk. And it is a wonderful portrait. I think it is the best. So let's keep this man in mind as we go through the story of his estate. Now, the inventory, an inventory, as you know, is a list of possessions, and it's usually made on someone's death. There's a whole series in the British Library in London called the Bengal Inventories, which cover a period of about 50 years, and luckily they include Claude Martin's inventory. It was made immediately after his death, so we're looking at work that was done in the last two weeks of September, 1800. Inventories are really the poor relation of historical research. People tend not to use them very much, and yet they present a fascinating picture of day-to-day -day life. And certainly in Martin's inventory, we get an idea of the whole range of his interests. And this is why I thought it was important to not only publish the inventory in full for the first time, but to get six experts to look at various aspects of the inventory as we will go through it. And this is the first page of the inventory, or rather it is the first page I could find in the British Library. The inventory itself starts rather abruptly at page 44. 44 is written in the top corner. So it's quite possible there are another 43 pages either lost or waiting to be discovered. But this is what greets you when you ask for the Bengal inventory. It's the inventory of goods, chattels, credits, and effects of the late Major General Claude Martin. And by this, it also means the people who owe money to Martin or owe money to his estate. You won't be able to see all of this from the back, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the inventory looks like. It's on the left-hand side. It's fairly good handwriting, but it is 18th century handwriting, so you are puzzling over some of it. And on the right-hand side is how it was transposed. It doesn't match exactly, and you probably can't match it up exactly. But this is what we had to work from, and this is how we actually published it. So that gives you an idea. And the handwritten inventory itself in the British Library runs for 80 close-packed pages. And if you can imagine 80 pages like that on the left-hand side, it's quite a task, actually, uh, transcribing it. And in fact, it took about... 10 years to identify all of the books in Martin's library. That was the, a 10-year task I set myself. So let's, let's look at Martin's buildings, first of all, to see what is meant by an estate. And estate, first of all, is the buildings in which the possessions are. And you will be familiar, of course, with the Chateau de Lyon, that for years was known as the Fahad Baksh. This, in fact, was a later name. 
Martin himself called it the Chateau de Lyon for obvious reasons. And this is inscribed on the arch facing the river. So we have a view from 1976 when I first started working on Claude Martin. And we have a much earlier view from the riverside. So you can see the chateau from both sides. And you will be familiar, of course, with the idea of the basement stories being flooded during the monsoon. I don't think I'm telling you anything you won't already know, but it's always nice to see pictures. And here we are, the upper basement story of the Chateau de Lyon. There are two basement stories. The bottom one, I think, is almost permanently flooded, unless people have been pumping out the water. So this is the top story. And this was um, an excursion by boys from La Martiniere several years ago, exploring the tunnels. And I can assure you this would not have been allowed in England for health and safety reasons. So I particularly like this picture where you tend to put interest and academic knowledge above fairly petty things like health and safety. And Claude Martin's other estate at Nudjevka, which is about 17 miles south of Cornpour, Cornpour rather, it took a long time to discover this. We knew about it. It was an indigo estate, but nobody had actually gone out and looked for it until I went out in 2000, without a map actually at the time, but by talking to people, we realized there was a village called Najavgar. And when we got there, we could see just the remnants of one of Martin's buildings in the river. It was just one wall standing, and I'm pretty sure it won't be standing today. So another sort of trick is, if you see something interesting, make sure you photograph it, because it may not be there next time you go. So this is Najafgar, and again, we're looking across the Ganges at Martin's buildings. Obviously, he didn't build them all. There's a temple on the right-hand side. But he did build very substantial indigo vats, which are still there. And he didn't have a huge number of possessions at Najafgar. The main estate is concentrated in the Chateau de Lyon. But it is worth mentioning this. And, of course, you know where we are today. At the time of Martin's death, Constantia was not complete, and that meant that there were not that many things, actually, in the building itself. It looks as though he'd shifted the library there, and we think some of the paintings were there. But most of the material that is discussed and listed in the inventory comes from the Chateau de Lyon, so he hadn't moved everything there. This is an old picture, and you can see the horse and carriage on the right-hand side, and you can also see the boys sitting on the roof, dangling their legs. Nothing changes. Now, what was Martin's motive in building as he did? He was very influenced by what was going on in the West at the time, and this was a fascination with newly discovered classical architecture and statuary, and by this, by classical, I mean Greek and Roman. The cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were discovered in the late 18th century, and the statues and the paintings that were found there profoundly influenced European culture and European thought. It was a craze, if you like. It was comparable to finding Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922, when there was a sudden craze for everything Egyptian. So if you can put yourself back and imagine Claude Martin and his friends, a sudden craze for anything classical, and you can see those statues there, and you can see on the right-hand side, there's a little sphinx sitting down with wings. Now, Charles Townley was 
an English aristocrat. And interesting enough, Claude Martin was in touch with him because Townley had a large collection of Roman coins that Claude Martin wanted to buy. And there's some correspondence between them. And they're talking about Roman statues and that kind of thing. In the end, it doesn't look as though Martin purchased the coins. But the two men certainly knew each other. And the man sitting in the center was a fairly influential writer. And Claude Martin had his books. So there are a number of connections, though this is a townhouse in Westminster, in London, there are certainly connections with Constantia. And I mentioned the Sphinx, and here we have our own Sphinx, taken many, many years ago, probably in the 1970s. But you see what I mean about the influence of the classical, the Egyptian, is coming into Constantia. And on the right-hand side is one of the many little medallions that Martin had made. These line the walls. If you look closely at the doorways, you will find these little medallions. They're often whitewashed quite thickly, but I was given one or two some years ago which had not been painted. And again, you can, you can see the strictly classical outline of the face. For a long time, it was thought that Martin had commissioned Josiah Wedgwood to make these plaques. Well, that was pretty ridiculous because Wedgwood was not going to make thousands and thousands of plaques and export them to India. Martin had one or two original models of Wedgwood and he simply got local people to make them from local clay. They dug the clay out of Martin Purva and made these little models. They would have made molds and stamped them out one after the other, which is why some of them are similar. So here we've got a fairly strictly classical house in the middle of 18th century India, which is looking towards Europe. Now, balloons, I think the one thing we all know about Claude Martin is that he sent up the first hot air balloons in Lucknow to the astonishment of Nava Vajid Ali Shah. It's a very well-known story. It is probably one of the best known. And in fact, it features on the cover of a fictional account of Claude Martin called Trotanama by Alan Seeley. If you look at the cover of Seeley's book, it's got um, Trotanama based on Martin going up in a balloon. But we never found any written evidence. There was nothing in Martin's letters to say, I built a hot air balloon. We only have one contemporary description. But going through the inventory, I found these items, 29 bags of gum tragacanth. And this is a sort of um, what they call gum Arabic. It, it's sticky. It sticks things together. We don't know how big the bags were, but 29 slides is quite a lot. But I think even more telling, 52 yards of crimson taffety or taffeta, 65 yards red or lackey taffeta. That's a huge amount of red taffeta. And I think, I'm almost certain, that these were the fabrics of the balloons. They would have been built over a bamboo framework sent up into the air by hot air. So they were gummed onto the bamboo framework and gummed together. This is all the evidence we have, but I think it's pretty good. And I think it backs up the stories we've heard about Martin and his balloon. So you, you have to take what you can get from different sources. Carriages. Martin had 19 horse-drawn carriages. He had an enormous stable, probably at the Chateau de Lyon, but I think he was moving his carriages here. 
So when I came past the horses today, I thought, oh, this is where it should be, the stables. He not only had horses, but elephants and camels. And he got his carriages made from the best carriage makers in England. They would have been sent in pieces and assembled here. And Martin himself talks about driving around in a carriage. And I think the reason is that one story we believe to be true was when he left Lyon to join the French company des Andes, his mother said to him, don't ever come back unless you're riding in a carriage. And I think that stuck with him and haunted him forever. We also know that he had window glass in his carriages, so you weren't sitting there with the wind blowing through. You actually had imported window glass to fit the carriages themselves. It wasn't that easy to drive a carriage, certainly in this part of Lucknow, because you could only do it on a proper road. And as far as we can tell, there, there was no dedicated road coming down from the Chateau de Lyon to Constancia. So I think the carriages were, <coughs> excuse me, more, more or less for show. But 19 of them, that's a pretty good show. <coughs> Martin was um, fascinated by anything mechanical. And in one of his letters, he gives very detailed instructions for a clock. And in front of the clock, he wants to have moving mechanical figures, and he sends instructions to the French clockmaker. You see down at the bottom, he's put the scale of um, three feet. He's drawn this <coughs> to, to give an idea of how big it should be. And he gets completely carried away in describing what he wants. He wants a kind of mountain or rocky escarpment where wild animals will appear and birds in motion appearing to sing by the motion of their beaks and their wings, a cascade of water, the illusion of running water, and ducks swimming, a bridge by the side with a cottage, and galloping riders. Now, you might think this is all pretty fantastical, but if we look at 18th century clockwork mechanisms, they could reproduce all of these things. You could actually get birds that did appear to open their mouths. You, you could give the illusion of water flowing by little glass rods that turned over and over. So it's not as fanciful as you might think. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to the clock. And something else that Martin was fascinated by was the mechanical or barrel organ. This was the first time you could actually produce mechanical music, which you did by turning the handle of these barrels. This is what's sometimes known as barrels, and you can see the little protrusions there, which will give the noise. This is um, probably about 1750, and Martin described what he wanted, and he also said he wanted 10 new barrels sent every year, because he really wanted to keep up with the music of the time. He was very, very musical, and I like the idea of him waiting for the next 10 barrels. And if you can imagine, how, well, certainly how I used to wait for pop music. You'd wait and wait, and then there'd be a new song. Martin was doing rather the same with his barrels, except he had to wait rather longer than I did. Things took about a year to arrive from Europe. So again, another fascination with the mechanical, and even more so with the steam engines. He ordered two steam engines from England, from the prime manufacturers, Bolton and Watt, in Birmingham. And it took me some time to figure out why he would want steam engines. He wasn't driving a train, obviously. It hadn't yet been applied to trains. And then I twigged. It was because the basements of Chateau de Lyon would fill up with water every year during the monsoon. And we know that Martin had them cleaned out and redecorated. He had the water pumped out with the steam engines. 
He found difficulty in getting them to work at first, but this is what they were for. And for a long time, in the grounds of Chateau de Lyon, there is a building marked Steam Engine House, so they continued to be used. In fact, these were the first steam engines imported into India. The East India Company was not that interested in them at the time, and Martin went ahead and ordered the first, which is why he had some problems getting them to work, because nobody had seen anything like it before. I think in the end, he had to bring an engineer out from Birmingham. And moving on to armory, in the infantry, there's a huge list of arms, shields, guns, anything to do, in fact, with arms, weaponry, and defense. This is a particularly fine pair of pistols with Claude Martin's name on. These were not made for sale, but he did, in fact, produce a huge amount of stuff for the East India Company. He was selling arms to the East India Company. He was manufacturing them in the arsenal and selling them as well. And this, I thought, was interesting. Um, for a long time, there had been rumors that Martin had a powder mill, which is where Government House stands today, Raj Bowen. And it sounded a bit like one of these urban myths. We couldn't prove it one way or the other until an architect friend of mine was asked to survey Raj Bowen, and she was allowed down into the basement with a camera and measuring tools, and what she found was these great barrel vaults, called Martin's powder mill, so that's confirmed the rumors that we'd known about for a long time. And if you think about it, um, you're storing gunpowder here. You've got to have an enormously thick vault, and you've got to have a number of them. So the gunpowder is kept separately. There's no point in having gunpowder in a huge shed, because one spark is setting everything off. So you separate the gunpowder, into these brick barrels, and you can see that the top of all these barrels made a very, very good basement story for the building that went on top of it. It's known as Banks Bungalow, but I don't know what the original name is, but this is the origin, the core, if you like, of Government House today. I'm not going to make any jokes about the governor sitting on a powder keg. I'll leave that to you. And here we are again from Bolton and Watt. Martin is having medals made. He's very proud of the title that the Novab has given him, Asa Vadola has given him. And he's having dyes sent out, not only for medals, but he's actually paying his workmen in coins that he himself is manufacturing, copper coins, and the die is stamped, so they're Martin's coins. There's a whole lot of research to be done on the coins and medals of Claude Martin, and people have started. For a long time, we just found odd medals and that kind of thing, but systematic work is now being done on it. So just another example of Martin's interests. And in fact, among his, his possessions were a printing machine and a dye machine. And the, these were very much sought after at the time. Again, he was something of a pioneer in importing things from Birmingham. This is a seal which is actually at La Martiniere Lyon, so you probably won't have seen it. I don't know how it got there. And we think probably that the top of the seal on the left hand side has been altered or renovated. But this is the impression on the right hand side when you actually use the seal. Martin was a great collector of precious things. This is a jade mirror, and it was found and exhibited in the Los Angeles 
exhibition on Lucknow way back in 2010. And at first, it just seemed like a good example of a jade mirror, probably made in Lucknow. But in fact, when they examined it closely, they found that Claude Martin's name was actually scratched at the top of this. So we know this was one of his possessions. It's really beautiful. And we have another jade sword here. And this is actually inscribed with Martin's name. You can perhaps see at the bottom. Um, General Martin Saab, East India Company. And this was awarded to him in 1796 by Asaf Adola. It was one of the last awards he made, probably for Martin's part in the Second Rohilla War. We don't know, and there's some dispute over the date. But again, this combines two of Martin's interests, armory, jade, so it's both decorative and presumably practical. Now, among all those many possessions, we, we, we move away from the great things like the arms and the silverware and the portraits and everything. There are a lot of miscellaneous little domestic items. There are pages and pages where it says one drawer full of miscellaneous items, a drawer full of buttons, pencils, children's toys, old tableware, things belonging to the electrical machine. This is why it's so interesting reading it, because it's as though the clerks were walking from room to room and just noting down whatever they found in the order in which they found it. And this was one of the few items that I was able to illustrate. It's a bottle of cephalic snuff, and cephalic apparently just means to do with the head. And it was the fashion just to sniff up snuff and sneeze. It was quite addictive. But I was lucky enough to actually find um, a picture of a bottle of 18th century snuff from Yale University, who kindly let me have the picture for free. So we're not just talking grand things like balloons and carriages. We're actually talking domestic detail. We're talking about things like Martin's toothbrushes, his hair powder, his clothes, none of which, of course, we can illustrate, but they are all listed there. <clears throat> and one of the items that really puzzled me in his inventory were 500 wooden horses and I couldn't work this out. I thought, were they children's toys? Why would anyone need 500 of them? And then I discovered that the, it was, in fact, a form of punishment. This is the only illustration I could find, but it shows you how it worked. If you were bad, and particularly if you were in the army and you were bad, you were hoisted up onto this grotesque wooden horse. There's a woman behind the man in blue, so she's obviously done something bad as well. And if you look at the man's feet, he's actually got weights tied around his ankles. So this is gonna make it even more uncomfortable. So he's astride this sort of wooden bar being dragged down. And Martin apparently supplied these wooden horses to the East India Company and it was the way in which the company would punish its soldiers. So that's not only British soldiers, but Indian soldiers as well. And this is nothing that I've come across in any documentation. It was only by chance I found it, and I realized Martin was actually providing the East India Company with these sort of instruments almost of torture if you like, and this doesn't accord very well with some of the things we know about him, but on the other hand, it does demonstrate what a complex man he was, quite prepared to provide something like this to the company. And we talked briefly about Martin's great library. There are at least 720 volumes listed in the inventory, but many of those have a number of 
books together. So we're possibly looking at something as large as 5,000 books in his library. And I'm pretty sure he got the library transferred here to Constancia before his death. And this is his book plate. This was actually found together with the um, portrait of Martin I showed you at the beginning, which appeared in a Dutch auction. Ex Libris Claude Martin from the library of Claude Martin. And you can see very familiar themes here, obviously. The motto at the top, Labore Constantia, the fierce lion there. And in the bottom, you can see cannons, which of course are very much part of Martin's living because he was superintendent of the arsenal. You can see a rather cross elephant. Um, and you can see cannonballs and all the equipment that really goes with war, warfare providing weapons, and of course the Inavabi fish on the flags there. So this is a rather good example of his book plate. There's more than one, I believe that you have one here, and there's another one slightly different in the British Library. But because this came from the Dutch auction, which we know belonged to Zoffany's paintings, this seems like one of the most authentic. So if you look at the lion, and then we see our old friend here. Um, it is, of course, a pun on Lyon. A visual pun is called a rebus. And this tickled Martin's sense of humor. And the lion there would have been holding a torch, a lighted torch, in its paw. And of course, torches were put behind the lion's head. This is why there are little gaps at the back of the head. So you could put in a lighted torch. And the idea was to scare any intruders who were bold enough to cross the Gumpti and to try and attack Constancia. The lion is very much a symbol of Martin, just as it is of his birthplace. Now, mentioning the books, I didn't want to go through them all, but it took, as I said, a tremendous time to track them down because in the inventory, they'd just been given in very, very abbreviated form. So this, I think, was just encyclopedia um, and Diderot. So what I had to work out from the number of volumes was what it was likely to be, when it was likely to have been published, and then try and trace the title. And I've been able to do this in nearly every case. Obviously, it's, it, it becomes easier because it's not going to be referring to a book after 1800, when Martin obviously couldn't collect any more. So we've got a fairly good idea of what interested him. And it's not only this sort of serious enlightenment type stuff, but um, other books too, quite a number of novels, some in French, some in English. There are cookery books, which I thought was interesting. There are books on botany, and there are several erotic novels. And when I try to read one of these exotic erotic novels in the British Library, I was ushered to a corner and told to sit quite apart from everybody else. And they brought me this book, which was only mildly erotic. But I like the idea that by reading it, I might contaminate other readers who are sitting at the next, the next desk. Ridiculous, but anyway, that's, there you go. Um, now I wanted to say a little bit about Martin's love of botany and flowers. And there's absolutely no doubt he was extremely interested in plants. And at the time, there was a great sort of wish to examine and catalog plants. And Roxburgh, William Roxburgh, who was working in the Botanic Garden in Calcutta, was trying to delineate everything and give flowers their Latin names. And here in Martin's own hand, he's actually asking what the Latin name of this flower is. It's actually Gloriosa Superba, the climbing lily. So Martin has painted it, and he's painted it in great detail. You can see the stamens, 
and then he's trying to identify it. And this is just one of about 600 paintings of plants in the library at Kew Gardens, which we've now identified as belonging to Claude Martin. It was thought they were Martins for a long time, but it wasn't until a botanist from Scotland started to go through them that he actually found on the back of two of them Claude Martin's stamp. And when he found that, he was so excited, he told me about it, and we were both absolutely thrilled because it shows they were, in fact, Martins. They were auctioned on Martin's death, but we think probably in luck now, and we think they were bought by a friend of Martin's called Gore Oosley, whose son in turn presented them to Kew. So we're able to trace that fairly convincingly. I'd mentioned Nudjavgar, and again in the British Library, there are a series of letters beautifully written in sort of Persianized Urdu from Martin to his servants at Nudjavgar. So when Martin is either at the Chateau de Lyon or supervising the building of Constantia, his servants are supervising the indigo and the silk production and everything on the estate at Nudjavgar near Cornpore. And it is lovely. It, it, I had to get somebody to translate them, but you can make out um, the dates and the names. And Martin is very careful to say to his servants, make sure you treat the weavers properly. Don't let the zamindars intimidate them. It, it, very much somebody of enlightenment beliefs who thought people should be treated the same, who are trying to do away with hierarchies. And here we are, and Martin actually says, we can establish a lodge here in my new chateau. This is not the Chateau de Lyon, this is the chateau here, this is Constancia. And he is writing to his friend, General de Boyne, another Frenchman who's actually gone back to Europe. And he is very insistent that when de Boyne comes back, de Boyne comes back with jewels of the masons and all the equipment you need to actually establish a lodge, a Freemason's lodge. And Labore Constancia, there are a lot of very fanciful stories about this, but it's quite obvious it comes from a 16th century motto, Labore e Constancia. This is where it's from. It's a Freemason's motto. It's the name of a Freemason's lodge. It's nothing to do with a woman who might have been called Constancia, whom Martin might have fallen in love with. Not so. And I wanted to finish by showing you pictures that you would probably be familiar with. This one is a conversation piece in Colonel Pollier's home. And we've recently identified Colonel Pollier's house as being on the north bank of the Gumpti, probably beyond where New Hyderabad was. It's taken us some time to establish it was there. And we don't know exactly where it was, but we are working on it. So Martin is not having to go very far to meet his friend Antoine Pollier. He's simply crossing the river. And there are lots of elements I think probably you will be familiar with, including the servant on the right-hand side, who is one of the Kadir brothers, either Machu or Chota. And he is holding a scroll which shows the newly built Chateau de Lyon. This was painted in 1786, so the chateau had been up for about four years. And Martin is standing up, he's wearing his red coat. He was always very, very proud of the company coat. So he's standing up and pointing at the chateau. Whereas on the other hand, Antoine Pollier, again in a red coat, is pointing at the fruit from his garden that the gardener has brought in. And on Pollier's table is a Mughal manuscript because he was a great collector. And at this period, late 18th century, 
the great Mughal libraries are being broken up and a lot of the manuscripts are for sale and they're being snapped up by Europeans. Martin was not a great collector of manuscripts. We haven't found much at all, but his friend Antoine Pollio certainly was. And in the middle of the picture, looking at the audience, looking at you, is Zofany, the artist. This is in the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. And this is also in the Victoria Memorial too, but it's not on show, so you may not be familiar with it. Um, the Navab Asafadola in the middle with that sort of characteristic droopy moustache. And he is sitting in front of the Mughal prince, Jawan Bakht, who's come to Lucknow, actually escaped from Delhi, the Mughal family in Delhi, and has fled to Lucknow seeking shelter. Between Joan Box, the prince, and Asafadola is Warren Hastings, the governor general. He is almost bald on top, but you see, like many men who are going bald on top, he's actually got a pigtail at the end to show he's still got hair. Now, if we go in, the third person from the right is Claude Martin, and Martin is leaning forward in that sort of eager way that we know he had, and... He's tapping Colonel Mordant on the shoulder to tell him something. This is an unfinished portrait, but it's very, very vigorous. You actually have to ask to see it. If you go to Kolkata, I had to ask them to bring it down from the attic, but it's well worth doing. And the one you will be familiar with, the cockfight, Colonel Mordant, again on the left-hand side in white, Asafadola, the fairly plump man in the middle and Claude Martin sitting on the sofa looking slightly quizzical, one leg over the other, he's not quite sure. <laughs> Martin, despite what he said, was actually quite keen on cockfighting. He says in one letter, I really don't like the way Asafadola, you know, does cockfighting, that kind of thing, I wouldn't do it. And so in the infantry, we find quite a number of cockspurs and we think, you lying, you know, you did enjoy cockfighting. And this, I think, you will all be familiar with, but one thing we've been able to do, and this is due solely to Sami Ahmed, who did some detective work in the archives of Constantia itself, and found out that Boulogne's name, for years we've struggled with this uncomfortable Boulogne or Lisa. Well, hang on, which is it? Neither makes much sense. It turns out that Boulogne's real name was Bula. Now, if you put Unissa, this is going to be Bula Unissa. It's a very common title for women. And if you say it quickly, Bula Unissa, it does sound a bit like Boulogne or Lisa, and somebody took it down wrongly, and it was never corrected. So I'm delighted we can give her back her proper name. This is really important. And she's standing next to Zulfika, the little boy she adopted. He veered between Islam and Christianity. Sometimes he was Zulfika. And sometimes he was James Martin. He actually um, died as James Martin, but he still used the name Zulfika. And this was a kind of easy time when you could move between the two. Bula and Nissa was always a Muslim. She could read and write Persian. And she was probably Martin's favorite mistress. Again, it's a portrait by Zofany. It's one of the most beautiful portraits anywhere. It's never left India, and it never will. And this is the last slide. This was my book. This was the result of all this hard work. And I'm happy to say that I've got a copy to present to the library. And I think I'm going to hand it over to the principal. So thank you very much. I hope you've learned a little bit.
after that very interesting uh, exposition. It's uh, a little difficult and a little overwhelming to be able to put it all together. And as I sat listening and looking at the slides, I was amazed that one man's life, uh, in one man's life, there could be so many different facets and so many different things to be done. Claude Martin died at 65. I am 62. I've got three years left to come to even 2% of what has been described and shown to us. The last of the Renaissance men, definitely in India. He indeed is the founder whom we have reverence for almost to the level of being an icon or a saint, which of course he was not. I am grateful to have received a copy of uh, this book and personally handed over by the author herself, which makes it even so much more valuable. In a moment from now, I will invite you to join us in a little cutting of a little ribbon to establish what we propose as the Claude Martin uh, Research Center, which uh, is to be filled up in time. It is in the same campus as the Claude Martin Museum. And so you will immediately see the distinct link between the two. I would request, uh, Sherry, the booklets. Okay. Uh, Rajveer and a few of our prefects are passing around uh, little uh, leaflets on the Claude Martin uh, Research Center, which I would request Dr. Llewellyn Jones to inaugurate for us. At the moment, it's filled with emptiness, of course, but in the years to come, the aims and objectives which we have uh, uh, recorded, the tasks that we hope will be fulfilled, it will be wonderful for the girls and the boys who are here, who are present here, in the years to come, for those of you who are interested not just in history, because what I'm noticing is that you can be a scientist, you can be a mathematician, you can be a writer, and you can still be doing sterling work in history as well. So keep that going, and this research center should indeed have everything connected with Claude Martin, whether in primary, secondary, or even a tertiary form, so that it will be a wonderful testament to uh, where he is. How lovely that we had Dr. Llewellyn Jones tell us about Claude Martin, indicate what kind of research across continents has been done on Claude Martin. A little mirror from Los Angeles. Another snuff bottle from Yale University. Daggers and swords and pistols from different parts of the world. Suddenly, a Zoffany three crayon uh, painting um, sketch coming out where Claude Martin looks at us directly in the face eye to eye, step by step, in every part of the world, there does seem to be something about this great man. A great man must not be put on a pedestal. A great man has to be considered with all his flaws and imperfections as well. If he is a saint, you will no longer 
have to be like him. You would only have to worship him. But we are fortunate that our founder was no saint. And we know how he must have enjoyed reading those little books, which our guest today didn't tell us how she reacted to, but also read in a darkened corner of the British Library. Not the happiest place to be reading that, I'm sure. But a man like all of us. Let this spirit of inquiry and this understanding of Claude Martin continue. And of course, Dr. Llewellyn Jones's contribution to our modern understanding of this very ingenious man is unsurpassed. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us this evening. Uh, I now hand you back to Rajveer and uh, request Mr. Kira to also propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it was indeed uh, uh, an unknown chapter of history and uh, the way uh, Dr. Rosie Levelin Jones made it come alive, uh, which is so true that dead he lives in us today. So uh, with that, uh, someone rightly said, no duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks. So I'm honored to be standing here this evening delivering the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I start by thanking our esteemed speaker of the day, Dr. Rosie Levelin Jones, who's much more Martinian than any one of us here today. Her books and lectures each time open a new chapter in history and only make us more curious about our surroundings. Thank you, Dr. Rosie Levelin Jones, for accepting the invitation and for enlightening us today. I thank the principal, La Martinia College, Mr. Carlisle McFarland, for so very generously hosting this event here and which better place it could be than La Martinia to learn about its founder, Major General Claude Martin. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. I must mention and thank uh, Mr. Dyrell Bennett and Mr. Alfred Gomes, whom I have bothered with all the arrangements and who never ever let my phone go unanswered for even the smallest thing that I requested them for. His staff and his student volunteers of La Martinia College deserve a very special thanks for executing all this flawlessly today. Above all, thanks to you, the wonderful audience, including all the guests, friends of Rosie, fans of Claude Martin, lovers of history, old Martinians, and the boys and girls of La Martinia College, and of course, their teachers who have led them here to attend this event today with a purpose of learning more about the founder of La Martinia, Major General Claude Martin. I'm grateful to all and each one of you. Thank you and vive La Martinia. Ladies and gentlemen, before we leave this hall, we have some books written by Rosie here, which have been kindly placed here by Universal Booksellers. So if you wish to buy those, uh, the latest book, which is Empire Building, is also available here. And if you wish to buy those, Rosie will be happy to sign them for you personally. And later we can go for the inauguration, which probably uh, they'll announce, and followed by tea there itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable insights, and thank you, sir, for that vote of thanks. I would now like to request all authorities to kindly escort our guests to the Claude Martin Research Center for the inauguration ceremony. It is far more convenient for the book signing and purchase, etc., to be done in this hall itself.